It is well known that America is a country of immigrants from all over the world, but our country has also been a refuge for people fleeing hardship. It might be famished like the Irish or economic hardship like the German or persecution and war like the Russians. This grand tradition has not stopped for the modern era and every year thousands of people look to make a new life in Pennsylvania. However, some of this is not necessarily a choice for these people. They are refugees who are fleeing war and persecution. They are struggling with re resettling, learning English, and housing. Lancaster County, Pennsylvania is the refuge capital of the world. It takes 20 times more refugees than any other city in the world. Today, we are talking with the CWS Church, who have made it their mission to help as many refugees as possible. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, thanks for having us. I'm Haley Whitney. I am the Communications and Volunteer Engagement Specialist with um, CWS, that stands for Church World Service. And this is my colleague, Andrew. He can introduce himself too. Hi, yeah, my name is Andrew Mashis. I'm the Community and Faith-Based Engagement Specialist at Church World Service in Lancaster. Yeah, so we're just gonna talk a little bit about what refugees, you know, what they are around the world, who they are, um, and how they end up in central Pennsylvania. So I'm gonna share my screen here. So we're going to start here um, with refugees. Who are they and how do they arrive to Central PA? So our office is located in Lancaster City um, and we resettle refugees and immigrants into our office. So refugees, what is a refugee? So a refugee is somebody um, who flees their, their country because of persecution based on one of these five reasons. So they're um, fleeing because they feel unsafe because of their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Um, so those first, you know, a couple kind of self-explanatory, the last one, membership in a particular social group, this can be your gender, um, if you're a member of the um, LGBTQ community, many refugees, qualify as a refugee um, for one of these reasons. Some of them qualify for uh, multiple of these reasons um, and they are unable or unwilling to return home. This um, definition was defined by the um, United Nations in 1951. That was after World War II, um, but refugees have existed far, far beyond that, far longer than that. Um, and refugees are, are displaced people. And so there's displaced people all over the world and a refugee is a um, definition kind of within that category. So when you look at these numbers, you'll kind of see that breakdown there. So in the world, there are 79.5, and this is going up, unfortunately, um, million displaced people around the world. So this is people who are not um, able to live in their home. Um, they, yeah, they're displaced. They don't have a, they don't have a place to call home. Um, and so this is refugees, asylum seekers. Asylum seekers are basically the same as res refugees. They are um, only then um, presenting themselves at a border. Um, so that's kind of what changes the definition there. Um, and then internally displaced people. So that's people that um, are displaced within their home country. So within that 79.5 million displaced people, there are 26 million people who have been defined by that, um, that definition that I showed you um, initially. So that's kind of how the breakdown works. So fleeing to safety, um, after fleeing their homeland, so refugees have three options. So their first option, usually we want to return home. Um, this is this is everybody's first option. Nobody wants to flee their their home where there's they're comfortable, where maybe they've grown up, their family, their friends are there. Um, so that's the first option, and that's the hope that we have for all displaced people that they would be able to return to their home country safely. Unfortunately, sometimes this isn't a possibility um, because of conflict that might be happening in the area. Of course, persecution, like we talked about. Um, they might not be able to return home. And so then the second option becomes to go to a second country and hopefully a second, um, possibly a bordering country. Um, you know, they're welcoming to refugees. There's possibility for children to be enrolled in school. Um, you can get a job there. And then sometimes, unfortunately, that second country is, is not able to um, welcome refugees. Maybe they have their own conflict that might be happening or they just don't have the capacity um, within their, their country. And so the third option is to resettle into a third country. And this is permanent. 
um, to permanently resettle. And that is where um, CWS Lancaster comes in, where refugee resettlement um, comes into play. We are able to welcome families um, and individuals in that way who are resettling to a third country. So this is kind of um, what it looks like in a, in a refugee camp you see there on the left. Um, this is life before resettlement. So sometimes there's that limbo. A lot of the time there's that limbo in between um, where individuals, you know, they can't go back home. They can't really resettle into a second country, but there's, there's this waiting place for them to stay. Um, and so sometimes that looks like a refugee camp. Sometimes that looks like what you'll see that picture there on the right, um, more hiding in plain sight, that's urban displacement. Um, but typical time spent in displacement, wherever that may be for families arriving to our office. So that means, you know, once we finally see um, families, families coming to Lancaster, um, a typical time spent that they have been waiting has been 17 to 25 years. So when you think of that, um, there are many children who have been born in displacement in refugee camps who that, you know, that's their entire life. They, they haven't really had any other experience other than that. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a very long journey um, and time that, that folks are waiting to, to be resettled. So we're gonna pass it off to Andrew to kind of talk about how it works um, once, once we are able to welcome refugees into our communities. Yeah, thanks Haley. Um, so this uh, slide is essentially going over what they call the uh, refugee admissions uh, program, which is the, the amount of refugees um, that the State Department of the federal government will allow in for each year. Church World Service contracts with actually a number of federal agencies, including uh, Department of Homeland Security, the State Department, Health and Human Services, all that sort of create this web um, and system for refugees to be able to get resettled into our communities. Um, the numbers here actually reflect the different, um, the amount of refugees that have been admitted into the country uh, every year, you can see dating back to uh, fiscal year 2015. So this stretches out uh, over a course of eight years um, that, and the admission ceiling that is reflected is determined uh, by, the, by the president of the United States every year. After uh, consulting with Congress, he or she will then uh, sign that into an executive order. Today we are facing the worst global, uh, the worst refugee crisis in recorded history. Um, but what's uh, typically unknown is that refugee resettlement um, is really only available to less than one percent of the world's refugee population. Um, as as Haley alluded to, um, the various options that refugees have when they do get displaced from their homes, um, the overwhelming majority will either stay in their uh, neighboring countries or second countries for uh, sometimes the remainder of their lives. Um, and so being able to uh, resettle into a third country permanently um, through, these, through the refugee resettlement system uh, does only happen for a very small uh, minority. And typically the United States um, thankfully has been historically a leader in refugee protection um, in being a safe haven for refugees uh, dating, dating back to World War II. And I think it's um, very important to note because I think sometimes um, things can get a little confusing when we're talking about issues around immigration. Um, and so I think it's important for people to understand and know that refugees are, are fully legal permanent residents who are eligible to work in the United States. Um, they have been vetted by the United Nations um, through a, a rather complex system that includes uh, interviews and medical checks, and that can actually take uh, several years to process. Um, they are fully uh, known within um, the federal government system. So when they arrive, for example, one of the first things they do is they will apply for social security. Um, they are eligible to uh, start working on the first day of their arrival. Um, so they are fully legal permanent residents who are eligible for a green card after one year and citizenship after five years of their date of arrival.
And as far as CWS is concerned, um, the role that we play as an organization, as an agency, um, is not only just helping resettle families, whether that's uh, finding uh, finding housing or employment or enrolling kids uh, in, in the, the local school system, but it's also working with the surrounding community to create um, that sense of welcome. A lot of families that come to uh, the CWS office have experienced um, immense trauma throughout their lives. And so being embraced by the surrounding community um, is extremely important, uh, especially for families who might not know the English language or the nuances of our culture. Um, so we typically really work with um, various groups of volunteers um, and community members to sort of do some of the things that you see here um, that are actually just normal human fun activities to do. Um, and so we, we often encourage the broader community to be able to embrace our families in that way. Thank you so much for sharing the slideshow. Um, there are a couple questions. So um, where are most of the immigrants that you help from? Yeah, that's a good question. All over the world. <laughs> We have people that are, you know, displacement doesn't really discriminate against, you know, where people are coming from. We have people that are from the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's a very large um, population for us. But we have people that are coming from Ukraine, a lot of countries in Central America. We've been seeing recently um, some families that are coming from Central America, um, Iraq, uh, Somalia, all over the place where you can really you know, we see it fluctuates um, each year, the different um, people we see from all over the world that, that are coming in through our office. Um, and definitely, we usually will see kind of patterns where we'll be seeing people, um, a large, you know, influx of people from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so um, we're able to kind of doctor our, you know, cultural trainings and things um, for, for that. But yeah, we, we do see people from all over the world. How many people each year do you help? Yeah, so that also fluctuates um, depending on, so those numbers that you saw that Andrew talked about, um, right now we are actually, so it's a presidential determination that is um, determined solely by the president of the United States. Um, and every single year they, they sign away what number of refugees are resettled. And so um, on average, it has been, I believe around 95,000 um, refugees that we resettle. Um, in the United States, but the past couple of years um, with the previous administration, we were down to this past year it was 15,000. So there's been less um, that we've seen in our office um, in the last couple of years, but we're hoping now, and we're actually waiting for um, President Biden, this is actually pretty timely um, to sign uh, a presidential determination that will raise that number again. Um, and so hopefully then we'll be able to see um, closer to around, you know, the numbers of like 100 individuals or, or more than that even um, within our community. But this last um, year, especially with COVID-19, we've, we've definitely, our numbers have decreased. Do you reach out to the people to help them or do they have to come to you? How do you find these people? Yeah, um, do you wanna talk about that, Andrew? Sure, sure, I'll, yeah, I'll give you a break. Um, so essentially, uh, as I alluded to earlier, we contract with a number of um, both federal and global government agencies. Um, so the UN, the United Nations, uh, has a subdepartment called the United Nations um, High Commissioner of Refugees. And so that agency will deploy people all around the world in refugee camps, um, into various urban areas, into wherever there is significant conflict uh, happening. And they will conduct a process um, that includes doing several rounds of interviews, um, medical checks, background checks. Um, it's, it's, it's rather extensive. And then what will happen is they will essentially allocate various families um, to, third to third countries, including the United States. 
So the State Department and other agencies will then contact um, the, the contra their contracted resettlement agencies. So there are nine resettlement agencies that, are, that contract with the federal government um, and Church World Service is one of them. And so essentially they will get a profile of a family. They will alert, let's say our global office at Church World Service um, and then Church World Service, our global office will look at the different uh, satellite communities that which Lancaster is one and see if it's a good fit. They will contact us and then, um, yeah, we usually uh, will process them from there. So um, I'm sure most of my viewers, when they think of Lancaster, they think the place with the Amish. So what is special about Lancaster? Why is Lancaster one of the uh, cities that um, is taking in these refugees? I'll let you take that one, Andrew. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, partly because it is something that Lancaster uh, County has, has done for 300 years. Um, so essentially, Lancaster County was founded um, mostly as a safe refuge for people coming from Switzerland and Germany about 300 years ago. Uh, so the state's founder, William Penn, um, would have welcomed various uh, groups that were fleeing religious persecution, particularly in Western Europe, um, and, and essentially uh, labeled Lancaster County as a place for them to settle. Um, it had very good soil, it was good farmland, um, and still is to this day. And so uh, I think a lot of that has to do with tradition that has been carried on now for generations and generations. What was um, people from Switzerland and Germany 300 years ago uh, eventually became you know, Vietnamese refugees after the Vietnam War. Uh, to today, people from Iraq and Syria. So you could almost say that um, Lancaster's refugee polity exists because of the Amish and not in spite of the Amish. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's, and that typically um, becomes one of the things that people find most unique about, about this place. So um, I've understood that this policy of helping refugees is somewhat controversial. How has the town it itself uh, responded to their new neighbors? Yeah, I think as Andrew talked about, just like the history of Lancaster um, having this welcoming, you know, surrounding area has been a huge part of that. Um, I wanted to pull up these numbers too for you. So like in 2016, we welcomed 407 refugees to Lancaster. And so that's kind of the numbers that we're looking at. And so if you think about that over the years, um, the community itself is just vibrant with immigrants and refugees who have been living here now for decades. I um, mean, I think that that's a huge part of it. Um, and so there's communities that are already in place and ready to welcome. I mean, we've seen, we've seen huge support in that. And many, many times if there is some sort of, you know, if there is somebody who, who finds it to be controversial, a lot of the time, you know, we have had staff members who have just gone out to coffee with people um, and staff members and also refugees themselves who have just gone out to coffee with people and shared stories. And that's kind of how we found um, that dialogue to, to happen when, it, when you can sit down and talk to somebody and share the story of, of you know, why you had to, to flee your country, it becomes more real. And I think um, that's, that's something that we're continuing to work on you know, as an office, um, just telling the stories, helping you know, people to tell their stories. And um, that, that's kind of where we kind of can come down to the fact that we're all human. And, and if any one of us was forced to flee our country, what would we do? And so um, just putting ourselves in other people's shoes and, and that's kind of the dialogue that we, we have with our community. Um, now, how did you feel, um, either of you personally, about the Trump administration's immigration and refugee policy? And how did that affect your work? Yeah, I mean, we can both speak to that. We're still kind of um, feeling the effects of those policies. Um, we haven't had any 
uh, arri refugee arrivals, and, and Andrew can speak to this as well, um, because of, of those numbers. And so we're waiting and hoping that um, in the future we can start to welcome um, refugees again. And it kind of partnered with the COVID-19 pandemic. It was just to, you know, there was already anti-immigrant um, policies being put into place. And then on top of it, COVID-19 was kind of just the, the last reason that the administration needed to kind of keep people out. And so now we're, we're still really hoping to get those pipelines filled up again. And um, everything even overseas has kind of stopped now because of COVID-19. And so we're seeing and hoping that um, people will be, be able to be interviewed and, and we'll be able to get those um, processes up again. But it really did slow down the work that we do. And I did, I wanted to mention as well that as well as refugee, you know, resettlement program, we also have other programs as well, which really is an amazing part of our office. Um, so we have a resettlement program where we resettle refugees and with that in tandem with that, we have a um, preferred communities health program. So, um, clients can, can work with us further after that. And then for up to five years, they can work with our employment program. Um, so we're able to, to work with clients to get them into the workforce, working with English as a second language skills. And then lastly, we actually have an immigration um, legal services program within our office that has accredited um, individuals who can, who can go to court um, in, immigration law. So um, we, we have quite a breadth of things that we do within our office. And yes, all of these policies have affected every single one of our programs, but um, thankfully we've been able to continue to do the work that we, we have been doing um, through the last four years. And, and hopefully now moving forward, we'll be welcoming um, refugees here soon, but it affects Andrew's work quite directly um, as he, he works with um, churches and organizations to support refugee families. And when you don't have any refugee families coming in, um, there's, there's a little bit of hardship there. So I'm sure he can speak to that a little bit too. Yeah, actually, I, I would like to sort of answer this question with a story. Um, sometimes I find that to be um, one of the best illustrations. Um, you, you asked about personal um, you know, how has it impacted us personally? I think, um, especially over the last, let's say four years, this rising anti-refugee, anti-immigrant sentiment that's going, uh, that has gone on. Um, it's really been the first time in my life that I have seen how uh, public government policy has affected real people. Um, and so I always, my mind sometimes goes back to um, when my, I have a four-year-old son and when he was a baby, um, when he was about six months old, I can remember I was sitting in a living room um, with a bunch of friends and, and um, there were several uh, refugees from Somalia in the, in the room and we were celebrating um, one Somali woman's birthday. Uh, we got her, you know, we got her a cake and cards and balloons and, and the whole works. And she had uh, a seven month old son. Um, and so I can remember watching uh, my wife with my son, um, trying to calm down uh, my son who was crying. And I watched this Somali mother um, also at the same time, because my son was crying, her son was crying. Um, and so she's trying to calm down her son. And I can remember, um, I remember, you know, she, my wife needed a break. So I took uh, my son to try to help her calm him down. And I can remember this Somali mother sort of looked at us and essentially uh, said something along the lines of, it is nice for you to have your husband help. Mine is still stuck in Somalia um, because of the policies that have been enacted. Um, her family had been separated. And um, that, that memory has always stuck with me of how these kinds of things can affect real people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it doesn't just exist in a bubble. Like these ha every action has a reaction and consequences. And even when we think the smallest stuff, um, especially in government, it does affect real people because that's what government does. 
and it's supposed to help people, but sometimes it ends up hurting them. So what can our viewers do to help? Yeah, so we have plenty of opportunities to get involved with our organization. Um, we kind of stick with four things. We say you can donate, um, so you can donate in-kind donations, um, like physical items, um, or you can donate you know, money um, or donate your time through volunteer work. Um, so that can be um, virtually or also hopefully here soon in person once it starts warming up again, um, we'll be able to do that. And you can go onto our website and see all the information there. Um, we say educate. So educate yourselves, educate your friends, your family, um, even just listening to us talk right now. And, and that's that's an amazing first step. And then the fourth thing is advocate. So um, always, like we're saying, policy is, is involved in the work that we do. And so advocating for your refugee, refugee and immigrant neighbors um, through signing petition or calling your Congress um, people when there, when there are some policies that um, you feel strongly about. And I am the communications um, specialist, so I can't go without saying just to go on to our social media. Easiest way if you want to stay involved is at CWS Lancaster. We're on Instagram and Facebook. And then our um, website is cwslancaster.org. But yeah, if you ever have any questions, everybody in our office is very accessible and we're always willing to to have these conversations because they are really important. Andrew, Haley, thank you so much for being here today. It means a lot that you can discuss this with us. Um, and our viewers, thank you for listening.